Stand up, stand up for Jesus. That's just like you did it Sunday in church, wasn't it? You can do that. You can stand up, stand up for Jesus. That's a good thing. All right. We're going to sing together, Lord, reign in me. Three, four. Is this your prayer this morning? The Lord comes in His power and His glory to reign in us. If it is, then join with us as we sing. Over all the earth, Lord, You reign on high. Let's join together. Over all the earth, You reign on high. Every mountain tree, every sunset sky, on my one request. Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Won't you reign I hope that's your prayer this morning, that the Lord would reign in this place. Let's sing. Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, to do me more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your heart, over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I have. And Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I won't you reign in me again? So won't you reign in me again? Amen. We want the Lord to reign in us. We're going to praise the Lord together for eternity. Let's continue that this morning as we sing to Jesus, our Holy One, our Anointed One. We want His presence to be so thick in this place that we would see only Him. As His Word is proclaimed in a few moments, we would see only Jesus. Let's sing together. No. 
and I learned to really believe that when a mad mama elephant chased us when we were in a jeep in Africa one time. They are big, and they do shake the earth when they run after you. An elephant is very big. But what you see is what you get. There's nothing more to the elephant than what you see. An iceberg looks big on the top, but the huge part of the iceberg is under the water. It was Jesus who said, Do not be like the hypocrites who do all their prayers in public when they are seen of men. They have their reward. They get seen of men. But when you pray, pray in private. Isn't it great worshiping the Lord as a family together like this as we gather day by day, having such wonderful musicians using their gifts to help us live praise and worship to God? But if you go through your day and the most time you spend in the presence of God was here, You're an elephant and not an iceberg. God has called you here to learn the discipline of spending more time alone with God than you do when you're in public. It is the iceberg that ought to reflect your spiritual life and not the elephant. In this early part of the semester, are you getting those habits set? It's important to be here to worship and be a part of this public praise of God and hearing His Word minister to you. But He wants you in private for conversations with just the two of you. Don't be a fat old elephant when you can be an elegant iceberg. I'm going to ask my wife, Rhonda, to come and join me here on the platform. She's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Then I'll ask her to make a brief announcement. She has a great passion for reaching women and helping women mobilize to reach other women in their church and their community. For 20 years, she's been teaching student wives here on our seminary campus, and for the last several years, teaching women from all over the country how they can mobilize to reach other women in their church and community. Would you lead us, please, in a word of prayer? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a wonderful experience it is to come into your presence. Lord, not just here in the gathering of many who love you and who are here to just express their commitment to you, but, Father, it is such a blessing and a privilege for us to come together with you just one-on-one. Father, thank you for the love and the grace and the care that you provide for each one of us. As we're beginning again a new semester, Lord, we pray for renewal of our own personal commitment to you. Father, may nothing in the busyness of our days and the demands of our studies, Lord, ever interfere with that time with you in prayer and in Bible study. But instead, Lord, let all that we learn from you in this personal relationship flow out into our lives and ministry each day. We love you, Father, and we thank you for this precious time of worship and for your presence with us at all times. It's in your precious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you and just remind them, be cool like an iceberg, not fat like an elephant. Would you do that? (laughs) Thank you so very much. We do welcome you to this time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I have a question for the men in the audience. I want to see if you learned as you grew up and developed as a man what I learned as I grew up and developed as a man. This is a fill-in-the-blank question for the men in the audience. When Mama is happy... This is something that is built into the DNA of us guys. We all learned that. Well, men, I want you to understand that you have done, those of you who are married, have done something really traumatic 
with your wife and your family. You have brought them to a very unfamiliar place, and New Orleans doesn't feel anything like home. And your wife, who loves you, and that's why she is here with you, is having to undergo a great adjustment. It's bigger for her than it is for you because you have the joy of classes every day that fill your time and put you in connections with other students. And these professors, they really work hard so you don't get bored while you're here in New Orleans. They take that very seriously. Have you seen your syllabus and learned to appreciate that? Well, it's a lot harder for our wives sometimes to make those connections of friends. And many of you got called into ministry in a fairly recent time, and your wife may still be trying to get a handle around the fact that the person she married ended up being a preacher and not what she expected. Our seminary has a great concern and a great love for our student wives. And so for a number of years, we've been offering classes one night a week, free of charge, with free child care for preschool children available for our student wives. They had their first meeting on Tuesday night, but this coming Tuesday, your wife could still begin the class if she comes this coming Tuesday. I've asked my wife if she would take just a moment and tell you about that class. It's a very special class. This one taught this semester that is taught every year. I think every seminary spouse needs to go through, needs to hear it. Would you please tell them about that and any special activities coming? Well, it was my joy when we began as students here at the seminary to attend a wife's class, a class called the Minister's Wife. And since that time, in 1975, our school has been supporting the student wives by providing free classes, training throughout the year for your wives, for them to be able to understand who they are in Christ, how they've been gifted, and called to be involved in ministry alongside their husbands. So every Tuesday night during the year from 7 to 9, we offer a class for student wives. It's free, and free child care is provided in the preschool center by reservation. This last Tuesday night, we were packed out. It was so exciting for many women to gather to attend the class called the Minister's Wife, which is the intro class, a required course for our six-hour certificate of excellence for student wives. We had a wonderful response. And then we have a second class for those ladies who have already taken the Minister's Wife. We we're offering this term personal Bible study that's being taught by Mrs. John Christie Gibson. It's a wonderful time of fellowship. It's a wonderful time of just spending time with the Lord, learning from Him, and being prepared for whatever ministry God has called you to. Please encourage your wives to come. If they didn't come this last Tuesday night, it's not too late. They can join us this coming week, and they can enroll either for the minister's wives or for personal Bible study. And keep your eyes and ears open for other classes that will follow the rest of the year. Thank you. One more time, when Mama's happy... Encourage your wife to be a part. It will help her make a difficult transition. Our preacher for the day, Dr. Jim Shaddix, our dean of the chapel. As we prepare to hear from God in just a moment uh, about the Great Commissioning, this is, uh, this is part two, right, Dr. Shaddix? Uh, I want us to, uh, I want you to, if you will, just close your eyes and just listen to a scripture passage that's very familiar to all of us who have answer the call to ministry. We recognize Christ's presence in our lives and his intercession on our behalf. Let's listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? For God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And then that marvelous, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And here's our commissioning. But in all things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is great.
This may be new to you this morning. I want you to sing it with us, though. Before the throne of God above. Let's try it together. Before the throne of God above. Have a throne of liberty, a great high priest whose name is God, who never lives and sees for my name. My name is graven on his hand. My name is written on his heart. I know that one. How about this next one? When Satan tempts me to despair, let's sing this together. Satan tempts me to despair. Help me of the guilty thing Of when I look and see him there To make an end to all my sin Because of sin that saved your time My sins of old is now yet free For God is just in satisfaction Let's stand and rejoice together as we behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him there, the risen Lamb, perfect will and righteousness. The great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, I saw it perfect with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, just like my Savior and my God. Christ my Savior and my God, one with Himself I cannot die, I saw His purpose by His blood, my life is filled with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Continuing to worship the King together this morning. victorious. Our victory will win. That's what I want us to think about this morning as we consider the subject of motivation for this great commissioning we've been given. You've heard the statistics from our North American Mission Board. They were so shocking to me. I thought and hoped and continued to hope that they were incorrect. 
A study suggests that 96% of us as Southern Baptists will go to our grave never having shared Jesus Christ with one single person. Several years ago, Dr. Kelly wrote an article in which he said that the problem of evangelism among Southern Baptists is only 10% programming, but 90% motivation. In the article, he talked about how we had at our disposal all of the training programs, all of the tools, all of the resources We were not a people that stand in need of more tools to be more effective in evangelism. We are a people that simply are not motivated. Do you struggle with motivation when it comes to this global mission that we're on? It might be the key. It might be the secret to our really embracing afresh what Jesus Christ has called us to do, if you at all struggle with the issue of motivation, I want you to listen very carefully to our Lord's words. I invite you to take your Bible and return to the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. I want to begin reading with verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's it going to take? What's it going to take for us to change those percentages, those statistics, to where we are moved, we're compelled to to access, to even access the the number of resources that we have to be a people who, who are aggressively and intently on this mission of making disciples of all nations. Last week we started walking through the great... And we said that we needed to understand that this is a real battle and a real enemy. Previous paragraph shows that Satan is, is, is on an intentional plan. He has a strategy and he's scheming to undermine the mission and to thwart the commission that God has given to you and given to me. And we said that we needed to learn to recognize the enemy's strategy. That we needed to, to consider the ways, not pitchfork, red suit, long tail, long ears, but, but in the subtle ways of, of the integrity or lack thereof in our own ministries. The ways that we put limitations sometimes on the places that we'll serve, the types of people that we'll minister to. All of those are a part of this context and, and more. But I'm not sure that that those address the issue of motivation. I I, I don't know about you, but but when I I, I think about the fact that this is a real battle with a real enemy, and I'm not sure that that moves me to to want to go out and take ground for the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't know that simply identifying His strategies is enough to really get us out of our comfort zone and and lead us to, to, to just launch a full assault on an enemy camp to, to make disciples of all nations. So I want us to add to that list today, and I want us to think about this issue of motivation. Consider this challenge this morning. Go with incredible confidence. That's what I want you to see in the Word of God this morning, that, that part of this commissioning, part of what He has, has sent us to do involves the assurance that we can go in this deal and, and in full assault with incredible confidence. Now, why is it we can do that? When you look at this passage of Scripture, you recognize that Jesus buttresses the Great Commission with, with two incredible statements of assurance. 
look at them. One is in verse 18 when he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The other one is at the end of verse 20 on the back side. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I want you to think about this first statement in verse 18, first of all. You know, this is a statement that is often bypassed, I think, is, is merely an almost arrogant statement, an, almost an arrogant reminder on the part of the Lord Jesus in which He's just saying to the disciples, now listen, I'm about to say something really important, and I just want to remind you that I'm in charge here, so you better sit up and take notes. That's the way we approach it sometimes. All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he makes the statement. He sends us out. Go and make disciples of all nations. But we really have to ask ourselves, did Jesus really need to remind these guys about that just so that they would be on mission for him? They had seen him raise the dead. They, they, they were looking at the risen Lord. They had watched him walk on the water. And, and yes, there were a lot of questions and there were a lot of concerns but did they really need a reminder about his position simply to heed the commission that he was about to give them? I think there's more here than that. In fact, I think it is this statement that reminded the disciples as it reminds us that we can go to every people group, every nation, every language under the sun with an incredible assurance of victory for one reason. And that's a word called sovereignty. You understand that that's what this statement speaks about. It's not just a statement about authority. Jesus says all authority. It's that three-letter word all, that little bitty word that sets this claim aside from mere authority and puts it in the category of sovereignty. You understand the difference between those two things? You, you see, authority can be limited, can be qualified. You can have authority, but not have all authority. Our president has authority here in this institution, but he can't go over to Southwestern Seminary and throw his weight around. He doesn't have any authority over there. Now, he's got a family member over there that has some authority. And, uh, and as he was saying a moment ago, our wives have authority in our home. Well, no, maybe that's not exactly right. Uh, uh, you know, the President of the United States has authority in the United States, but he can't go to another country and, and begin to, to throw out edicts. You, you may have some authority in your place of business or the, the place that you work, but you can't go to the business across the street and have authority. Authority is limited and qualified. But when you add that little three-letter word all to it, it changes the whole game. Jesus didn't say, look, I'm an authority figure. I've got some authority. He said, all authority has been given to me. That moves it out of the category of authority and puts it in the category of sovereignty. And that changes everything. Jesus' claim to sovereignty here is a reminder of a number of truths that I think serves to give you and I the incredible confidence that we need for evangelism not to be something that is driven by a program or a tool, but a motivation that we have based upon our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that would lead us to make disciples of all nations. If you've ever struggled with motivation in evangelism, I want you to take notice. First of all, it is a reminder that He deserves the worship. When Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth, it is a reminder that He deserves the worship. You say, what worship? The worship of all peoples, all tongues, all tribes, all nations, everybody that would fit into the category of what He's going to say in verse 19 when He says, you go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus deserves their worship. Now, the Bible tells us that whether voluntarily or forced, one day, everybody is going to worship Him as Sovereign Lord, right? Philippians chapter 2, verses 9-11 through 11 remind us about this. God has highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a statement of sovereignty. One day it's going to be fleshed out. Whether forced or part of the redeemed people of God. 
But there's something else. There's something else here in this claim that Jesus makes at this particular point in time in commissioning these disciples and through them in commissioning us. There's some clear allusions here to two other passages of Scripture. One, the Son of Man figure in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. The other, the risen glorified Christ in the picture of Him in Revelation chapter 5. And they proclaim loudly, undeniably, the worth that He has with regard to the worship of all peoples, tribes, and tongues. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, that Ancient of Days passage, Daniel's vision is this, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. That's sovereignty, but watch it. Look at this. That all peoples, nations, languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now you jump over to Revelation chapter 5 and we see the picture of the glorified Christ. Here's what John records. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Listen, friend, come in here real close. You and I are sandwiched between these two prophecies regarding the Messiah's worthiness of the worship of all people, tribes, tongues, and nations. And get it now, that has to be the beginning point. I'm convinced that that has to be the beginning point of our passion to make disciples of all nations. It's an understanding that He deserves the worship. My new colleague and teaching partner in ministry, David Platt, said it this way in some of your classes just a couple of days ago. Why should we reformat our entire lives to revolve around the mission of making disciples of all nations regardless of the cost? Because there are 3,000 tribes in Africa today who are worshiping animistic religions and who have yet to hear the name of Jesus. And Jesus is worthy of their worship. Because there are 350 million Buddhists in Japan, Laos, and Vietnam following Buddha's rules and regulations. And Jesus is worthy of their worship. Because there are 900 million Hindus today who are worshiping more gods than you and I can fathom. And Jesus is worthy of their worship. Because there are over 1.3 billion Chinese following humanistic philosophies completely devoid of God. And Jesus is worthy of their worship. Why should we go to the tough places, the dangerous places, the places no one else wants to go? Because there are over 1.2 billion Muslims who are fasting, giving alms, making only pilgrimages to Mecca, and praying five times a day to a false god. And Jesus is worthy of their worship. When someone asks you, Why you have surrendered your entire life to the mission of making disciples of all nations? The answer is simple. The glory of Christ is worth it. Jesus is worthy of the worship. But listen, are you ready for this? Come in here real close. Not only does He deserve their worship, He deserves our worship. He deserves your worship, my worship, as servants of His. You you see, this this kind of passion we're talking about doesn't doesn't come naturally. It it has to start with us as ambassadors of Christ. I, I don't even think the motivation of a love for lost people is going to get us out of our seats and move us out of the comfortable places into the uncomfortable places. I don't know about you, but I don't love people that much. I pray that God would give me a greater love, but I'm not convinced that a love for lost people is ever going to be enough to move us outside of our comfort zone. But I tell you what will. And that is a love for a sovereign Lord and an understanding of His sovereignty in this thing. What an incredible encouragement. What an understanding to bring us to the place that that our passion is driven by an understanding of who He is and what He has done and what He deserves. You'll never have a passion for all people to worship Him if you don't have a passion yourself. Verse 17, by the way, gives us a little hint at that. I want you to look back at it there. 
right before Jesus makes this statement about His sovereignty, you remember what happened? That, you know, they went to Him out there on the mountain in Galilee. And it says in verse 17, when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. You know, the re- disciples' response of, uh, of worship, just like the, the women who went to the, to the tomb back there in verse 9, if you back up a little bit, as they went to tell His disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice! So they came and, and, and they held Him by the feet and they, they worshipped Him. It was a natural response. And, and just like that, the disciples' worship of Him and right, right here seems so natural. It, it, it seems so right. But, but the next phrase, that's so uncomfortable. It's so fuzzy. It, 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 it takes something that is so beautiful and so grand and so de- glorious and it, it makes it so honest. And it brings it so down home. But some doubted, it says. It messes everything up. Now, there are a number of words in the language of the New Testament that are translated by our English word doubt. This particular word here seems to indicate more of a, a hesitation than it does unbelief. Matthew doesn't seem to be describing here uh, the individuals that were questioning whether or not he was the Messiah or not, or possibly even questioning that. But, but there was hesitancy. There, there was a stutter step. The, the, the word carries the idea of, 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 of being caught between two opinions, two directions, two ways, and, and that hesitancy that comes when you're, when you're trying to, to decide. I don't want to embarrass my daughter, but uh, she's here this morning, and she's a perfect illustration. If I love, uh, she, I shouldn't say this, but I love when she loves to go to the, to the toy store and pick out a toy. She gets some money for, for uh, Christmas or something. And boy, she loves to go, just like all kids do, and look at, look at all of that stuff. But every time we get there, and she says, okay, well, this is what I want. No, 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 no. I, I want this. No, I, I got to get this. And we'll stand there many times for an hour or so, you know, making that decision. And how often I've watched that. I've thought about myself with regard to the mission that Christ has got me on with so many distractions, so many things are going on. It's not that I don't believe it. It's not that I don't believe the commission is real. It's not that I don't, don't believe that it's important. But there are so many things that cause the stutter step. We don't know all of the things that may have caused that their lives. Perhaps something about Jesus' appearance makes them hard to recognize at first. I, I don't know. Perhaps they, they fear how He may respond to them, especially as they, they abandoned Him. And perhaps their Jewish scruples are still questioning the propriety of full-fledged worship of anyone but Yahweh. We don't know. Maybe they simply continue to exhibit an understandable confusion about how to behave in the presence of, of, of deity. Maybe, just maybe, they were still a little uncomfortable with the growing emphasis on the Gentiles, those who are not Jews. can't be sure, but what we do know is that some hesitated. You ever hesitate in making disciples of all nations? You ever take a stutter step, just get started and then back up? A distraction here, a distraction there. And the distractions are so subtle sometimes because usually it's not the bad things that distract us. It's the multiplicity of good things that are involved in ministry. It many times cause us to, you know, to take a step in the right direction and then we go, well, wait a second, well, this will be my small part of making disciples. And, I, and we never get involved. In telling people about Jesus. We never get involved in aggressively and passionately going, getting outside of our comfort zone. We get ready to go at some point and, and, then, and, and then we stop and say, but boy, I like where, where, where I am. I like my location. I, 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 like, I, I like the setup that I have. There's all kinds of things out there. I want you to understand we'll never be effective in our lives as disciple makers if our lives are characterized by hesitancy between wavering and worship. You think about the contrast of those. Worship implies devotion. Wavering suggests doubt. Worship leads to obedience. Wavering to opposition. Worship bears out in fear of God. Wavering bears out in fear of going. Luke 9 
61 through 62, Jesus talked about a disciple who was ready to follow him on the road, but he had a stutter step. He hesitated. This guy said to him, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me go first bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Boy, that seems so hard, doesn't it? But Jesus knew something that all of us knew. He, he didn't tell this guy not to go back. He just cautioned him. And this guy knew exactly what Jesus was asking him to do because the language of the New Testament it indicates a, a, the word that was used to dispatch a battalion of soldiers. It indicated a separation. This guy knew what Jesus was asking, but he also knew. Jesus knew that when he got back there for his family, he was likely to hear some of the same things that some of you have heard. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Aren't you taking this Jesus thing a little bit too far? Can't you just serve Jesus right here where we are? You're not becoming one of those fanatics, are you? Or maybe most painful of all, if you walk out that door, you're never welcome in this house again. And there are people in this room that have been there. And there's no stronger pull than the familial relationships we have in this life. And Jesus knew. He knew that it would be an occasion for, for stutter step, for hesitation. And the only thing that changes that is when we come to the place where our worship of Him is enough. It is enough to drive us because He deserves their worship and He deserves our worship. Secondly, He assures the response. Oh, I love this. I love this. You see, there's something else about His sovereignty. There's something else that His sovereignty means in this passage of Scripture. And that is that His sovereignty is a reminder, get this now, that there are people out there who are going to say yes. Can you accept that? If we can ever get our arms around that reality, boy, how it changes it. You know, we base our motivation sometimes on all the people out there that are going to say no. But do you understand that Jesus' sovereignty is a reminder that He's sovereign over not only the ones sent, but He's sovereign over the ones that are sent to. You ever thought about the fact that the sovereignty of Jesus Christ means that He's not only sovereign over the deployment, He is sovereign over the decision. you remember what He said about the church's success in Matthew 16? Simon Peter made that great confession. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, you're Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You know, that understanding gripped the New Testament Christians. The birth of the church was born out of an understanding of this very truth, that there was, there was a confidence that Jesus was Lord over the response as well as over the commissioning Acts 2.39, this is the way Peter kind of summed up, concluded his sermon as he was leading into the invitation there at Pentecost. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Do you see that? He had a confidence in giving the invitation because he knew there were some people out there that God was calling. They were going to say yes. Acts 2.43. Seven describes the New Testament church as praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church. Get it now. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Don't you go out of here thinking you can grow a church. You can grow an organization. You can grow a, 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 a group of people that get together and they do some stuff. But you can't grow a church. I can't grow a church. But He can. 
And he does. And he will. But, but, but sometimes we view this process of, of, of Jesus adding to the church uh, all wrong. We, we, I don't know about you, but uh, many times I, I, I think about lost people as if they were enemy personnel. They, they, they were soldiers and the enemy on the other side. Now I want you to think through this with me. Many times I I approach evangelism as if lost people were enemy personnel and I'm trying to convince them to defect. And so I go out and I try to talk to them or I find new angles or I do everything I can in order to try to convince them that they're not on the good guy's side, I'm on the good guy's side and they need to come over. I think we're looking at it all wrong. Would it change your perspective? If you knew that there were people on the other side that really belonged on this side? Now that seems subtle, doesn't it? But there's a huge difference. There's a difference in trying to convince enemy personnel to defect and realizing that there are some people over there that really belong over on this side. My personal worship time, I've been reading through the Gospel of John and I ran across some passages the other day that just just blew me away. Some of those texts that sometimes you, you've read many times, but you just totally missed it. John chapter 11, you know the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? John seems to indicate it was at that point that the heat was really turned up on seeking to crucify Jesus. But listen to this text, John 11:45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed in, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come away and take away both our place and our nation. But what a risk. The guy walks on water. He he raises the dead. But but we're going to ignore that. If he keeps doing that, they're going to come take away our place and nation. That was how perverted the sense of understanding of what God was doing was. Look at this. One of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people? And watch this now. And not that whole na- excuse me, and, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he said, and he didn't say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Watch this now. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. And isn't it interesting that it was from that day forward that they plotted to put him to death? Now I want you to look back at it now, whether in your Bible or up here on the screen. Look very carefully. I'm fixing to venture into an area that may be the biggest point of theological debate in evangelical circles today. But I'm going to ask you, because he is worthy of their worship and he's worthy of our worship, to wade through that discussion and set it aside and look at the text of Scripture for what it says. I want to encourage you today. I want to give you hope and motivation. I want you to hear the Word of God say that He died and He would die not only for the nation of Israel, but for all of the nations of people that were scattered abroad that belonged to God. Can you fathom the idea that there are people that are out there that are on that side, that belong on this side, and they are people under the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ that are going to say yes? We're asking the wrong questions. We're hesitating and taking stutter steps in theological debate, arguing with one another over Calvinism and Arminianism, and all of our questions are the wrong questions. The question of whether or not do they have a choice is irrelevant. We don't know. I don't know. The question of of, of, of does God choose some to be saved or not? I don't know. The the, the question of, of is it based on foreknowledge? I don't know. What I do know is there are people out there that belong to Him. That's what the Scripture says. And they're going to say yes. It doesn't motivate me to engage in theological debate over things that my finite mind cannot fathom. But it motivates me to know that there are some people out there that belong to God and they need to be rescued. And the only question we really need to be asking is, where 
Are there people that I can go to in order to rescue the people of God? John 6, 35-39. Jesus said to that crowd, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to Me shall never hunger and he who believes in Me shall never thirst. But I said to you, that you have seen Me and yet you do not believe. Look at verse 37. All that the Father gives Me will come to Me. And the one who comes to Me I will by no means cast out. All that the Father has given Me will come to Me. He says it again a little bit farther down that of all He has given Me I should lose nothing. I'm not going to lose one of them. Somebody says, well, they're, they're going to be saved anyway. That's what that Scripture seems to indicate. You heard everything up to now? Let's embrace that for a moment. Nothing's going to put... All, they're, they're, they're the ones are going to be saved that belong to God. He's sovereign. This is going to happen. So why not, why not just sit back and wait till it all fleshes out? Because He deserves their worship. Why? Why would we ever be satisfied Why would we ever be satisfied allowing one person that's on that side that really belongs on this side to go when that day could be spent with them worshiping the Sovereign Lord? Why would we ever be satisfied waiting till someone else does it, till till, till it's all said and done? Because the Bible teaches us that none of them are going to be lost. Why would we want one day to go by without them worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ? He deserves it. thought about those Navy SEALs that went in and got Jessica Lynch early in the Iraqi war. You remember she was part of that group that made the wrong turn and ended up in enemy hands. Our special forces team went in there, got her out of that hospital. I thought about some of the theological debate that goes on in our minds that causes us to step and hesitate happens in a context like that. What if they had said, well, you know, we're going to win this war anyway. It'll just take some time. We'll just leave her there and she can come home with the rest of us. Or the ridiculousness of sitting there and saying, well, she took the long, you know, wrong turn. We'll just let her say. Or to say, this was her fate. No. And there's a hostage. Or there's a prisoner. Everything gets put on hold. We'll even risk more lives to go in and get what belongs to us. Why is the people of God, would we not adopt that mentality with a clear understanding in Scripture that there are prisoners of war? There are people who are wrapped up in spiritual bondage that have been taken captive by the enemy. This is how Jesus prayed in John 17. You remember how He began that prayer? Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son that Your Son also may glorify You as You have given Him authority over all flesh and He should give eternal life to as many as You have given them. Look at it. Verse 6, I've manifested Your name to the men whom You have given Me. You gave them to Me. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom You have given Me. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom You gave Me may be with Me where I am. We've got to stop approaching this evangelism thing as if it were army personnel attempting to convince enemy soldiers to defect. We need to start approaching this thing as special forces sent in to rescue POWs. Now, before we leave this, let, let, let me make this personal in just closing this out. And You see, this applies to your situation. Wherever you are, it applies to mine. Paul was discouraged at one point because of the response or lack thereof he had gotten. Acts chapter 18 tells about his stay in Corinth. And the Bible says that Jesus came to him in the night in a vision. And verse 9 says, He said this, Don't be afraid, but I speak and I... And do not keep silent, Paul, for I am with you and no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in this city. You know what that means? 
And there are people here in New Orleans who are going to say yes. There, there are people in these housing projects around here that are going to say yes. There are waiters and waitresses in restaurants that, that are going to say yes. There are homeless people in the French Quarter that are going to say yes. There are students on these college campuses here that are going to say yes. There are seafarers coming in by the droves from every nation on the planet who are going to say yes. There are people in every community where your little family chapel church is located who are going to say yes. There are people in every one of those unreached places across the globe that are going to say yes. He is sovereign. And His sovereignty means those people deserve His worship. But friend, I want to encourage you this morning that you and I can go confidently and boldly because His sovereignty means... Some of them are going to say yes. Let's pray together. God, I thank You that You just didn't commission us to send us out with nothing. I thank You for a clear reminder that Your sovereignty gives us incredible confidence. Not only in our going, but in the responding of people that we go to. Lord, we pray for grace right now. Grace to be worshipers. And grace to be goers. With boldness and passion. Knowing you are sovereign over the whole process. In Christ's name, Amen.